What's up, Barcode Patrons? Hey, if you haven't heard, we're up for a People's Choice Podcast Award. To vote, just visit podcastawards.com, click on the button to vote, and choose Barcode under the technology category. Thanks for all your votes in advance, and as always, the support is greatly appreciated. Now, let's get into it. You're listening to the Barcode Podcast with your host, Chris Glandon, serving cybersecurity straight up with no chaser. Let's hit the bar and grab a drink. Hey, Chris, what's up, man? What's new this week in security? Well, I happen to know a guy in the Alliance. Let me give him a shout real quick. He's always ahead of the curve when it comes to the current state of security. Oh, so you know that guy up there? Oh, wait. Is he here at the bar? Oh, you know it. In the VIP section. Shows up weekly. He's got his entourage with him, too. A network of true security experts. Slinging security knowledge to all who step in his booth. Dude, he is iconic, man. Trailblazer when you talk about security podcast. He is the man indeed. One you should definitely follow, for sure. Uh, he does know his shit. Not only podcasts, but blogs, webcasts, even internet TV. Forget Howard Stern. This is the real king of all media. Speaking of kings, dude, you better check out this fresh drink we made for you. We call it the King Jubilee. We'll throw one and one third ounce of Bacardi white rum, half ounce of Lasardo maraschino liqueur, and one third of your freshly squeezed lemon juice. Nice, man. Well, let me go mic up. I want to go see what he's been up to. All right, Chris. Hey, check out his headphones while you're down there. See if he found a decent pair yet. And I'll see you all next round. Paul Asadorian is a security veteran that has spent time in the trenches, implementing comprehensive security programs across a wide array of industries. Paul is offensive minded having spent several years as a pen tester and hacker. He's the founder of the Security Weekly Podcast Network, which is a resource of the Cyber Risk Alliance. His programming hits on topics within the cybersecurity landscape from threats to enterprise security compliance and more. I must also point out that when Paul is not hacking or coding projects in Python, he can be found researching his next set of headphones. Paul, welcome and thanks for joining me. Hey, Chris, it's good to be here. So I guess my first and most important question is, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Okay, so what headphones did you go with? Or are you just sort of in an endless oh. loop of seeking out the ultimate headphones? Uh, sorry, that was my, I, you know, podcast veteran, and I forget to mute my phone, of course. Uh, I have lots of headphones. Um, I've uh, it spent way too much money on headphones so i don't recommend that people do that because it's i i don't know i also feel like headphones are something you have for the rest of your life and people have spent what i've spent on headphones on things like booze or wine you know wine and spirits and stuff and i like to think it's a better investment because these cans i'm wearing today uh are Audize lcd 4z's which are way too expensive for most people i mean unless you're really an audio nerd like don't spend that much money on headphones uh <laughs> if you do wear them as much as you can and that's why uh during our interview right now i am wearing them because every opportunity i get i am taking advantage of my investment uh these are probably my favorite ones that i have they're just they're really awesome planner magnetic uh auto is a company out of california they just do a great job i mean they're just amazing Re- not for most people they're re- i use my podcast hobby as like the excuse to go out. Well, I can justify that because I have a podcast. So I'll order some expensive headphones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, uh, I use the AirPods. Um, they've just become sort of my go to. I do enjoy a nice pair of over the ear yeah. headphones. Nothing like it. Absolutely. So, yeah, you've been in the industry for over 20 years now, much longer than most folks have been before there were degrees in cyber, before there were networking groups online. Uh, to become involved with. So I'm curious to know, what was it that sparked your initial interest in cybersecurity and, and how did you continue to learn 
with the limited amount of resources at that time. Yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, being in the industry that long makes me, um, well, old, I think is really <laughs> what it means. It makes me old. <laughs> um, but in terms of like, you know, everyone's got a different journey into cybersecurity. I'm always interested to hear other people's journeys into cybersecurity. For me, it started when I was seven years old. I was seven. I have the, the thing hanging on my wall of my first programming class that I took when I was seven years old on an Apple IIe. And yeah. I had in-person instruction, which I was thankful. My parents you know, sent me to that and bought me my first Apple IIe computer. And I learned how to program in basic. Um, and I, you know, coded things like Hangman and played games on it and stuff like that. And I just, I loved it. You know, I had like an affinity to, I loved being able to make the computer do stuff that I was telling it to do, like through code. I thought that was so cool. Um, you know, then throughout my like junior high and stuff like that. So like, I never had a modem. I think my parents watched war games and they're like, yeah, no, you're going to cause global thermonuclear war. So like I, I was using computers, but I wasn't like on the BBSs and hacking and, and all that stuff because I was more interested in, in girls, I think, at the time. Um, and then in high school, uh, I got the opportunity to take a programming class. And I'm like, wait, I remember this stuff. And I was like, wow, now I kind of like really like it. And what's interesting is, you know, when you talk about people's paths into this industry. I really suck at math. Like math is not my strong suit at all. And it certainly was not in high school. And I remember the vice principal going, so Paul, like you apply to be in this advanced programming class and you're taking basic programming now, but you've applied to be in Pascal. And he's like, so I took a look at your math scores and he's like, they're really not good. I'm like, yeah, I know, but I'm going to get an A in basic. And then you're going to let me take Pascal. Right. And he's like, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, since you're like so enthusiastic about it, I'm like, I'm not saying my math scores are going to get any better. I'm totally going to get an A. So I did. I got an A in that class. I got an A in Pascal because I loved it. I think because I don't like math, I just didn't put the effort in. Right. So that uh, just kind of continued my journey. You know, when I got a job in college, I did a brief stint in a, a paintball store and then was like, I really want to get back to this technology thing. So I kind of had like ebbs and flows. I think some people, may look back at their journey and have regrets. And sometimes I do feel that way. Like I, if I had just kept with that as my hobby and not gotten into other things and stuck with it, like th would things be different? But I always think back to that Star Trek Next Generation episode. I don't know if you're a Star Trek fan, Chris. No, 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 no. Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. I am too. But I okay. also like Star Trek. Don't, don't think of me differently for that. But <laughs> there's an episode where Captain Picard gets stabbed and has this flashback to when he was like a young cadet, got into a fight and was stabbed and has his heart condition as a result and him getting you know injured now. He wishes he could go back and not be in that fight when he was a young cadet. And like, what would things be like differently if he had played it safe? Yeah. And so they show his future uh, as if he played it safe, didn't get into the fight. And he's still like a low level ranking officer and he's not the captain of the ship. So... Regardless of what your journey is, my advice is, you know, you can't go back in time yet. So you got to live with it. So I took breaks. Like I said, I worked at a paintball store. Uh, and then I was like, I want to go to the job and do some programming. And I actually had to write code on a whiteboard uh, to get my first internship and show that I knew how to program. And I started at the bottom. And the bottom, this is like mid 90s, right? The bottom was I was the bub. And Bub stood for backup boy. And that meant <laughs> every end of it, each day, I would go to all of the developer workstations and I would put the tape in and I would turn the crank, you know, to lock the tape in and I would do the backups of all their systems. Right. And this was not advanced gear. I had a pair of vice grips that sometimes I had to turn the crank because the plastic handle, you know, had broken off. Oh, but man. they helped me be a better programmer and a hacker. Right. So just being in the environment, work. you kind of fed off of that. Being in the environment, I started working in IT there. I started writing more code, started taking on different coding projects. I got to work with developers there. And I'm thankful to this day, those people I worked with. I mean, and it was not an easy thing either. And I think that's one of the you know messages today when we see people want to get into the field. I'm like, 
a lot of us have started back in the day. Like it was not easy. And I don't want to discourage people from getting in our field, but there were like rules. Like if you were going to ask a question, you had to research it for 30 minutes on your own, whether that meant going to the internet, which was really slow back then, uh, or reading a book or manual or whatever. And you had to research it and show that you researched it for like at least 30 minutes. Don't spend too much time on it, but show that you're putting the, the effort in. I didn't do that all the time either. Sometimes I would totally cheat and get yelled at. I'm like, I know I'm going to get yelled at, but like, I want to get this thing done, right? Like I want to move forward. So I violated my own, my own rules. But I mean, basically all of that stuff, I didn't really realize it at the time, but all of that stuff was hacking, right? I mean, it was pure hacker spirit kind of stuff. Did you have any mentors when you came up? Like, I, I know that you did a lot of, you know, self-learning and, and you self-taught yourself a lot, but did you have any mentors, anyone that you looked up to or able to work with and kind of feed off of their knowledge? Yeah, there was several people. Um, the developers were great, you know, at my first job. Um, and early on, there was a, a woman whose name is Lori. She's, she was awesome. She was awesome. Um, she would definitely get get really pissed if you asked her a stupid question. And I just, I love that about her as much. I was like, oh, I'm going to yell that, right? But she instilled a lot of really good lessons uh, in knowledge and philosophy about like how to work in technology. I mean, really life in general, right? But like how to work in technology. She was like, you know, if you become an, one of her big things was if you become an expert at something, don't be afraid to become an expert, document it, teach other people and document yourself out of that responsibility. She's like, you are going to move up. You're going to be more beneficial to the company. And that's where you want to be. And don't look at it like you're protecting your little fiefdom. She's like, no, if you can transfer that knowledge to someone else, she's like, now you're a true expert and you can move on to the next bigger thing. Right. So Laurie and I worked very well uh, together in the early days. Uh, and I took forward, you know, a lot of those lessons. Uh, throughout my career, when I actually did start getting into secure, I had a great friend, Todd, that I was like, dude, what is this Linux thing? And he's like, well, I'm from the UK and I learned Linux in school. I'm like, we need to hang out. And he taught me Linux. And again, hard lessons. If I used the arrow keys in VI, he would literally hit my hand. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> he was like, no, you need to learn how to use it the right way without the arrow keys because the arrow keys aren't always going to work. He was right. So I appreciated that. And then like basically I got to working for a lottery company and the firewall guy got sick. I feel really bad that he got sick, obviously, but back then firewalls ran on Solaris and I had learned Linux and Unix and they were like, you know, we need someone to do security. I'm like, yeah, I'm all in. I'm like, this is great. And then it was just, you know, it was off to the races from there. I had a huge lab. We did a security audit. I was learning all the security things. And then I got involved with SANS. I'd say Steve Northcutt was one of the most influential people in, in my life and career. Uh, he just gave me so many opportunities you know, early on and encouraged me and wasn't afraid to give me opportunities, even though I was new. We were just talking about actually my first SANS paper. And now it's over 20 years ago. Again, I feel really old uh, about the bind T-SIG buffer overflow vulnerability, which kind of was the start of it all for me. So that's an awesome story. And, you know, I'm, not to say that you would have been a great professional paintballer, uh, but I'm glad that you stuck <laughs> with security. And you're right. Once you get that in, you're hooked. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've been doing this for, you know, quite a bit now. And, and now you've sort of evolved into the, the podcast realm and the content delivery side. And you always deliver, you know, the top quality content to your listeners. I'm curious, how do you stay ahead of the game? on the state of cybersecurity. Yeah, I think it's, you know, you always got to be reading and researching. You can't, and I think that's my philosophy, both of our podcast technology and, you know, keeping up with cybersecurity is you've always got to be learning. You've always got to be reading and you always got to be researching something and talking to your friends about it. Right. I mean, I, I didn't get here alone. I stood on the shoulders of giants that created this industry. My, co-hosts and all of my coworkers over the years, like uh, just the collaboration is just awesome. Um, and, and the people that have supported me and really just, you know, take my calls or my chats. So like, Hey, just want to want to chat. Right. 
Um, John Strand is one of my dear friends, and I just call him. I'm like, dude, I just want to call and chat. Like, that's the only reason I'm calling. Like, there's a lot of stuff we could be talking about, but let, like, let's just chat about life and let's chat about like what he's seen in cybersecurity. So I think, you know, always reading. Um, I listen to a lot of books. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I read as much as I can on any platform. Sometimes it's scrolling through Facebook. Sometimes it's Flipboard. Sometimes it's my my news feeds. Sometimes it's going in the right Discord channels and stealing their articles that they're posting to their news channels uh, in there. So like any way I can hack my way to getting whatever the the information is. And I, I think also, you know, staying technical. And, and keeping up with your technical and that's not that's not everyone's journey that's not everyone's thing and that's cool and i don't want to say that you need that to be in our our industry but when you ask the question specifically like podcast and keep it up with cybersecurity i think keeping a technical acumen is is important uh and that doesn't necessarily have to be a security project either you know i've written a lot of code for our, our podcast systems and it just keeps me sharp and writing code you know yeah, I was going to say, you got to stay, you got to stay sharp doing it. And it sounds like you really enjoy it too. So you put yourself amongst experts and you keep your technical aptitude up. Like it's kind of like perverse. Like it's weird. I like having that really hard technical challenge. Like I like it when shit, we can say shit, right? Oh yeah. Okay, good. Cause I just did like, I like it when just shit blows up and it's like a really hard technical problem like in my career like i described my, like some of the points of my career i have to be like really frustrated i'm like i don't want these problems like i just want to keep moving forward i, I think you reach a point in your career where you're like i, I kind of like this like being in the suck and having oh, yeah. that technical challenge that like you can't easily solve like that that's exciting to me and that sometimes is security usually it's linux um but it, it doesn't matter what it is right I like that. Like no one can figure it out easily. Kind of, kind of like my Google results are only like four results and have nothing to do with like Googled with. I'm like, yes, that this is where I want to be. And it's, it's weird. Yeah. You have to enjoy pain to yeah. a certain degree. Yeah. Well, I think it's like, you know, martial arts are working out, right. You got to enjoy that building muscle and, and really being uncomfortable uh, to really like appreciate where you want to go and your milestones and goals. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And you mentioned something about, you know, just keeping the pulse on cybersecurity and, uh, you know, knowing what attacks are existing now and, and the minute to minute shifts within the threat landscape almost. So it forces us not to be, um, complacent and you're always anticipating what the next thing is. So you have the supply chain attacks recently, you have more and more variants of ransomware surfacing, uh, but from your perspective, what do you see on the horizon that we as information security professionals should be concerned with uh, that most of us don't see coming? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's tough to predict the future. But if you look at the past, like we're just repeating ourselves. A lot of my research recently is looking into, you know, the past, the, the hacker culture as where it began and kind of how it progressed over time. And looking at previous security events, previous vulnerabilities, previous security researchers, how all this stuff put together and how it's changed over time may be the best insight as to what's, you know, what's coming next. Um, on the sheer technology front, you know, I, I think there's I think there's a lot of things that, you know, we might need to be concerned about with cybersecurity. As I get older, I'm realizing why my curmudgeon friends were like, nothing's really truly new. <laughs> Right, it's all variations on something. Someone's written a paper about it. Some attacker has used it somewhere, and, and I think studying the past in more detail is really our glimpse, you know, in into the future. I do think there are technologies that we need to be aware of that could present different challenges. I think certainly the way that we're developing software today has changed drastically. And the way that we deploy our applications has changed drastically. I think really changed the landscape for security. I mean, it really pulled the rug out from underneath us. When you talk about network intrusion detection and firewalls and antivirus, very little of that really applies to the way 
we put a tool chain together and deploy applications into the cloud, uh, whether that's on, you know, instances or containers or cloud native services or serverless. I mean, it's just really changing the landscape. And I think, you know, we've yet to see, uh, I think, really good solutions for the really hard problems with security uh, in, in these environments. Do you see, you know, with that, the SDLC and, and the progression there being able to help mitigate some of that? Yeah, I think it's a double-edged sword. I, I mean, yeah, we've got tools to push out code faster and automate things, but that also is opening up some of your attack surface as well. And managing all that stuff in the cloud is just a different attack surface. Maybe, maybe larger. I mean, that you know depends on the use case, but it, it's all just a different attack surface. I think if you do DevOps correctly, you can fix faster. I mean, you can also introduce vulnerabilities faster as well. So again, I think in security, a lot of it just comes down to process. Yeah. You know, whether you're managing your attack surface and your vulnerabilities on the IT side or on the application side, um, you know, it, it's all just a moving target and it's your people process and then technology that's really going to allow you to uh, be successful in that, but it's always a moving target. How do you feel about the evolution of bug bounty programs and, and just how they're becoming more aggressive now? Do you think that's good for the industry? Yeah, I think uh, bug bounties are um, a positive thing, but again, it comes down to process too. I think where bug bounties get a, a bad name is when people use them incorrectly. Like, for example, there's a lot of things you can do to look for stuff in your own environment that is probably not the best thing for your bug bounty hunters to find for you and have to pay out a bug bounty. We just completed a test on attack surface monitoring or attack surface management, however you want to phrase it. And I mean, the tools are just awesome. And a lot of the stuff that they're finding looking at your attack surface is stuff that people pay out bug bounties for. And I'm like, why wouldn't you just do that yourself? On the flip side, on the researcher side, I think the bug bounty programs have done, especially today, They've matured quite a bit and done a really good job to give researchers an outlet to responsibly disclose vulnerabilities and get paid for their work and not sell them on the black market. Although that still happens, albeit a little less. I think it did help move the bar in the right direction. Agreed. And if you're highly skilled at it, you know, you could be a full time bug bounty researcher. It could be very lucrative for you. What are your thoughts on non-conventional learning styles for those skills? So do you side with gaining knowledge and skills through free resources online? Or do you side with more of a structured approach via pursuing the certification route? Well, I mean, there's a lot of great resources out there. And I think it depends on one, where you're at in your career and two, what your goals are. And then phrase the question of, okay, what resources do I want? Right. I think if you're on the, you want to be on the red team side, I think things like Pentester Academy is great. Um, Pluralsight is great for coming up to speed quick on things. So there's a lot of low cost or free, like Cybrary uh, and lots of other resources, low cost free for you to just come up to speed on things. Um, the certifications are not bad. I like certifications early in your career. Um, you know, I don't think you need a degree. If you want to go get a degree, that's great. There's lots of ways to get a degree. And again, it depends on your goals. If you want to be a security researcher and more on the academic side, you may want to go get your degrees and masters and PhDs, and maybe you want to be a professor and that's a path. That's cool. Um, it doesn't mean you need to be super technical to work in our field either. So we have to be careful about the perception that we're putting out there as cyber security professionals and influence not just people who want to get in, but influence the media, influence HR departments that everyone's got their own path. So I don't think we should get hung up on, do they have a degree? Do they have a certification? I don't want to say people shouldn't get those either, but it depends on what your path is, right? And so if you're on the red team side, you know maybe you want to go for the OSCP, maybe you want to go for a SAN certification. Again, I like those early in your career to establish yourself to get some knowledge, get a base level of knowledge. And then from there, I think it's, you know, 
proof is in the pudding. You got to write about it. You got to have a GitHub repository. If you want to go down the really technical path, uh, you know, maybe you have a podcast or a blog that talks about the areas that you're interested in cybersecurity, whether that's management, whether that's compliance, that the stuff that doesn't, you know, embody the image that the media, I wrote a, I read a great article. I don't know if you heard it on the show. Her name was Caitlin. I apologize. I don't remember her last name. She wrote a great article about like, what's the perception of hackers and cybersecurity people? You only need to go to Google image search and start searching around before you realize that every image that you find, most images you find are of a male in the hoodie, right? You got to have the hoodie. Chris has his hoodie on. You can't see him, but he's got his oh, hoodie yeah. on, right? And it, it it gives this perception that you're this lone person in a basement, usually like it's a dark image. It's masculine colors. It's usually a blue or a dark green. And that there's also like code in the background, right? So it gives this image of like, wait, so if I want to be in cybersecurity, the media and the perceptions today are like, oh, I have to be male and I have to wear a hoodie and I have to be a loner in a dark place and I really got to know how to code. And that's just not a reality today. That's a carryover from our hacker culture that I, I, I mean, it's, it's a good and a bad thing, right? Like I understand where it came from. The early hackers were mostly curious people who happened to be male that were in their you know parents' basements with their dial-up modems and doing all that stuff and sharing information on BBSs with only those they deemed worthy, right? That's a carryover from our culture. We need to move way beyond that point and enable all sorts of people to be in our field, regardless of gender, race, and all those other things, and not paint the image like this is a, an industry where you have to communicate with people for the most part. I mean, you could be a security researcher that does that. And that's fine. But there's a lot of different roles. I like Ron Gula's data care and, and kind of mirroring it to healthcare, right? And I've, I've made this analogy a lot. And it, as much as I hate analogies, this one's really holding up for me. If we can mirror ourselves in the healthcare field, not everyone's a doctor. Not everyone's a brain surgeon. If you want to go do that, that's fine. There's a path for you to go do that. But there's lots of other paths. You want to work in healthcare. You want to help people. You could be a nurse. You can be a sonographer. My wife is actually a sonographer, right? Highly technical. Not all that dissimilar from what we do and looking at packets versus looking at images and looking for anomalies, right? The people that read are radiologists. They go to school for a really long time. But they also have to take a class before they can get into a degree program on medical terminology. People get hung up on our technology. I think there's a lot of great parallels to to healthcare being more advanced as an industry and cybersecurity learning from that, that there are career paths into cybersecurity that you can take these basic courses, that you can choose your individual path into cybersecurity and not painting cybersecurity as this image of you have to be male and super technical. Otherwise, you just don't fit because that's not true anymore. I agree completely. We need to redefine the meaning of hacker equals criminal and it's opportunity. You know, people unknowingly hack every day. If you ever rooted your Android phone, you hacked your phone. And I think we need to relay that message to the masses, uh, which is where the challenge lies. You know, instead of focusing on the negative that the media puts out there constantly refocus on the positive. And as podcasters, I think that we strive to do that. But from your perspective, how else can we relay that importance to the public? You know, Chris, it's an interesting question because when I, and I'm sure you get and everyone listening goes through this too, right? You talk to your friends and family about like, what's how they all, you work in cyber, like, oh, like that ransomware was really bad. And what I often say to a lot of people is I'm like, but yeah, on the other side, there are some people, some of them probably my friends that like they're in the suck right now. And they are working so hard to recover from that. Like there are people right now that are working till exhaustion to recover from that, to defend against that, to do the incident response, to eradicate the vulnerabilities and the malware and recover from the ransomware. Like there's a lot of people that work so hard, as we all know, in cybersecurity in this industry to protect our infrastructure. But when you see that as a blip on the news, the only thing they're talking about is evil hackers did ransomware again or broke into this or did that 
or the other thing. It's like, where's the defender story? Yeah, exactly. I have seen security experts responding to those attacks on the news more recently. And I think that's Mm -hmm. a great thing to get that side of it. Um, And and I hope to continue to see that. Even with Um, outages too, you know, really well, Facebook's down or whatever it is. I'm like, you realize there's a whole bunch of engineers that are pulling their hair out, working their asses off to get that fixed for you. I'm like, this stuff is not just magic. Like there are people that work really hard to maintain this infrastructure, to secure it, to engineer it, to maintain it. And I'm like, when something goes down, you, you can't just point the finger and go like WTF, like you got to have some, some respect. Like Disney plus, that was the other one too. I'm like you really, this is all when that first launched, I'm like, that is not a simple endeavor. Like you got to give them time. You got to give them the benefit of the doubt. So many people didn't because they don't understand the technology. They haven't been there when you've launched a product and it goes horribly wrong and you're the network slash security person, right? And trying to look at packets and figure it out. Yeah. Outsiders don't always grasp that, unfortunately. Um, So as a security consultant, I perform security assessments and gap analysis against many different industries. And I'm curious if you performed a gap analysis against the cybersecurity industry as a whole, what would be one finding that you'd say we need to fix or improve on and how? I really think it's a really good question because I have to think about it. I think it's it comes down to gaps in your security architecture. There are so many great pieces of technology, so many talented people, uh, you know, working to protect our applications, networks, and infrastructure. I think the the common most common failure point in my mind, having interviewed thousands of people and seen a lot of different security strategies, you know, over the years, a lot of different uh, organizations that are on different levels of the maturity curve. Uh, I think it's just incomplete programs is, is one thing that like knowing where to put your resources and effort in your security program and applying the right solutions, the right processes and the right people to that is the most common mistake. I think there's a lot of people who disagree and be like, Security vendors out there, you know, make shit that doesn't help us protect things. And I I mean, I give some pushback. It's hard for me to give pushback because we are completely vendor supported, right? In our sponsorships. If you take that off the table, there's some, there's great solutions out there, right? Well, like whether they give us me money or not, like whatever, like there's some really great solutions out there. And I think what, what fails people all the time is not knowing when, where, and how to get the right solutions, implement the right processes, communicate with the right people on an ongoing basis. And, you know, that's why we're in the position we're in when there's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of companies succumbing to ransomware, a lot of big data breaches. I think that's really, to me, the most common problem that I see. Let me ask you this then. Do you think the reason for that issue is because it's difficult to teach in a formalized setting or a certification path. I mean, it seems that unless you gain the knowledge of what certain tools exist through experience in the industry, it would be difficult to instill that knowledge. Yeah. Teaching that in a traditional setting is difficult, right? I think learning is about fundamentals and it should include some practice, but you really don't get that until you actually do it. And I think, you know, kind of back on the, career track, there needs to be fellowships, internships, shadowing programs um, so that you can see how it works in the real world. Um, and, and I think it is experience that teaches you that. And I also think that you know CISOs have one of the hardest jobs uh, in cybersecurity. And that probably is the most challenging thing is coordinating and organizing around your security program includes so many different aspects of the te- understanding the technology, understanding the architecture, so you're applying the right technology to the right problems, understanding what the latest challenges are, because there's challenges we know about and there's challenges that are constantly evolving and threats that are constantly evolving. And then I think one of the things you throw into the mix that in most organizations, the probably the most challenging thing is communication and teamwork. 
and getting that process down across the whole team. When I push my friends that do pen test today, I don't do pen testing necessarily today, right? Not in the scope that they are, they're doing it. I asked them, I'm like, there's got to be something in common to all the companies that just give you the hardest time on a pen test. Like, what is that? Like, there has to be something or a couple of things that you can draw parallels to and, and see that they have in common between those organizations that you're like, yeah, when we do their pen test, like, it's a huge pain in the ass. And the, the, if I were to summarize, I think the answers that I get, the hardest organizations to pen test are the ones that are the most organized and working best as a team. And they've just, I hate to use all the cliche things like defense and depth or embedding it in the culture and, you know, all those things. I think for me, it comes down to teamwork is really the, the one thing in common these organizations have is they're able to work really awesome as a team, that there's no silos, that everyone is on the same page. I said I wasn't going to use cliche terms and I just did, but you know what I mean? They're, they're it's working crucial, together. Though. I mean, what right? you're saying is absolutely crucial. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a team effort. It's not, I, I also think why we have gaps in our programs is because we're competing with ourselves right? You've got a silo over here. You've got developers over there. You've got architecture over here. And they're all trying to reach their own goals when the goal is as a whole as a company. Um, and people get too caught up in silos and in, in their own missions. Um, you know, those security teams that can go to anyone else in their organization and get help with security, with an incident, with remediating something, with making your organization and its infrastructure more resilient. And they just do that well as part of all their jobs and part of their, you know, teamwork and culture. Those are the hardest organizations to gain a foothold in. Yeah. Organizational unity. So you are based up in Rhode Island, correct? That's correct. So is there any unique or cool bars out there? Like what would be a good bar that you would recommend if I were up there for, you know, Rhode Island B-sides? For you, Chris, you need to come in here in the studio where we have a bar and we need to make some cocktails together. I'm down. Let's do it. Yeah, we should. Uh, Other bars here in Rhode Island. um, My favorite one actually just closed down. It's actually really sad. Uh, You know, COVID took its toll on the restaurant and bar industry, not just here in Rhode Island, but, you know, across the world. And uh, so there was one uh, here in East Greenwich. I can't remember the name of it now, but the bartender was just awesome. Like whatever she had for the drink special of the day, even if I thought it was something I wouldn't like, it was awesome. I'm like, you are, she would have, you know, the barrel where she'd be, you know, storing her latest cocktail creation and like whatever came out of that barrel was like the most delicious thing I've ever tasted in my life. Like it was just, it was just awesome. Awesome. Yeah, the bartender can definitely make the difference. Any speakeasies or secret bars we need to know the code to to get into? Yeah, there was one that was kind of like speakeasy-ish. I don't know if you needed a code to get in, but it definitely tried to embody the you know speakeasy and they had some you know vintage cocktails, but I, I haven't been down in that. That was in Providence. I haven't been down uh down there in a while uh to to do that, but there was there was one. Um cool, man. So the bartender here just yelled last call. Do you got time for one more? Absolutely. If you open up a cybersecurity theme bar, what would the name be and what would your signature drink be called? Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was a double question. <laughs> uh, double shot. Double shot. Uh, I, it, Hackers is my most favorite hacker movie. Uh, and anyone that wants to challenge me on that, I'm happy to have an open debate about it. And I will warn you, I've probably done more research than any human being should ever do into a hacker movie or any movie for that matter. Um, so I think the name of my bar would be called Hack the Planet. Love it. My One of my favorite cocktails, I have a lot of favorite cocktails, but one of my favorite cocktails is the Bloody Mary. And so I would have some kind of, some kind of bloody Mary, some kind of bloody Mary exploit, exploitable, but some kind of bloody Mary drink that would just be tuned for me. 
I, you know, I, I like the Bloody Marys that have like a meal on top. Right. So mine would have like cheeseburgers and like ribs and brisket. Cause I love smoking meat. Right. It, it would have like sausage and shrimp and it would just like, you'd have to get a special stand to hold up all the stuff you put on it and not skimp on the Bloody Mary. That sounds like it's like, um, an overflow vulnerability. Yes. It's a like Bloody Mary, overflow. Bloody Mary buffer overflow. It's a yeah. overflowing Bloody Mary, something like that. Yes. Yes. My recipe for Bloody Mary may, if I had to describe it, may go over time here in our interview. If I had to describe all the ingredients <laughs> in my Bloody Marys, which I make very frequently here in the security weekly office, it's a staple. That's all you need though. One salad drink where the ingredients take up the entire page. That's it. It is. It's an entire page. Well, where can our listeners find you online? Can you point us to your website or social media channels? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't so much post on social media. Uh, you can go to securityweekly.com and find out about all the things that we're doing, um, including some upcoming shows that we'll be launching, uh, hopefully in the very near future. And as far as where I hang on our Discord server, uh, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Subscribe to all of our shows, but also there's a link there for our Discord server. Um, so you can find me on the Discord server. I'm happy to chat. That's where I try and be the most responsive and hang out the most uh, is in our Discord server. So, All right. Very good. Well, be safe getting home, Paul. Thanks so much for your time. You take care. Thanks so much, Chris. Barco patrons. If you like this episode and would like to support the podcast, rate us on Apple Podcasts and visit our Patreon site, patreon.com slash barcode podcast. If you're interested in sponsoring the show, check out the barcode podcast.com slash sponsor. Cheers. Unfortunately, it's time to shut the bar down for this episode. Thanks for stopping in. See you next time. We'll save you a seat. Be sure to check us out at thebarcodepodcast.com.